don't know. <laughs> Are we waiting? Do we wait till? Yeah, we're just going to give it a minute as folks okay. come in from the waiting room. Okay. Will you tell us when to go? I yeah, will. You're yeah. Sorry, I will. Yeah, you could just sit back and relax, Julia, for at least a couple minutes. <laughs> Should I move the, this away from the door? No, no, no. No, I think it's good because it's, it's like, because we're going to, I'll start with being like, where are you? Yeah. You can show us around the hotel room. <laughs> Big, big, exciting tour. Got this lighting <laughs> just right. <laughs> All right, folks are joining us. Welcome, everybody. We're just going to give it one more minute while people join from the waiting room. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Wait, am I visible? You are visible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, Jill. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> it's are happening. We, how do we look? You look. You look beautiful. Look great. We look both of you. You, you look great. <laughs> all right i feel like we've got our crowd and other folks will trickle in as the event begins hello everyone i'm Susanna hermans i'm co-owner of oblong books we are independent booksellers in new york's hudson valley um, i would love it if those of you attending might uh, drop into the chat where you're watching us from today um, we love to see uh the the reach of our events and tonight we are so excited to be here to talk to Lisa Lutz about The Accomplice. And Lisa will be in conversation with Julia Dahl, our other dear friend, um, mystery thriller writer as well. Um, to introduce our folks, Lisa is the New York Times bestselling Alex award-winning author of the Spellman Files series and The Swallows, as well as the novels How to Start a Fire and The Passenger. She's also written for film and TV, including The Deuce for HBO and Dare Me on USA. She lives, I was gonna say, she lives in the Hudson Valley is the end of your bio, but you're gonna have to change that because you're on the move. So we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more about that tonight. Um, Lisa is joined by Julia Dahl, who's the author of Conviction, Run You Down, Invisible City, and most recently, The Missing Hours. Um, she, uh, Visible City was a finalist for the Edgar Award for Best First Novel, one of the Boston Globe's best books of 2014, and has been translated into eight languages. She's a former reporter for CBS News and the New York Post, and now teaches journalism at NYU. Um, while our authors talk tonight, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions about the book, about writing, about life about whatever you have questions about and we'll see if we can get to those toward the end of the program um and i will be dropping links in the chat to purchase signed copies of both lisa and julia's books um we appreciate very much if you would like to buy a book that you would buy it from oblong um, or your local independent bookstore it really helps us to stay here doing what we do um, and it supports our authors who have freely given their time tonight for this event um so i'm gonna vanish are you guys good for me to go we're good okay yeah. i'll be back for the end okay um, thank you guys so much have a great time <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you hello lisa hey <laughs> hi julia it's so good to see you i know you too and so we have to start with the elephant in the room or rather the <laughs> hotel painting in the room which is where so you were in the Hudson Valley I'm in the Hudson Valley your book yeah. took place in the Hudson Valley but you're no longer there yes I I put my house on the market I don't know last year sometime it took a while to sell and then it it sold at the worst possible time for events <laughs> so um we're basically closing this week I'm not even there uh and I've been moving for the last month uh so yeah, I'm in now. I'm in. I'm near Cleveland. Wow. Yeah. So on, what's the? Way. Where are you going? I'm. I'm moving to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Awesome. Is that? I don't know. Have you ever lived out there? I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but not for very long, and I feel like I didn't get enough out of it. And, cool. and I'm also just ready for a little bit. You know, I had a fairly rural uh, life upstate New York it was isolated which I enjoyed I was fine with it but I feel <laughs> like it may not have been the best thing for my social skills so so you're gonna go you're moving west to like be more citified 
I need a change. I would like to be closer to an airport uh-huh. yeah. inside to fly again. Cause I have to say getting to an airport from where I lived was, was a thing always. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's time for change and, you know, changes always help my writing. I got a lot out of that Hudson, Hudson Valley house for, for books. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, when are you like taking a route that's like, I'm just like, I'm sightseeing or are you kind of like beelining it? I mean, I'm, I'm not sightseeing, but I'm not racing through it because it's winter and I'm very worn out at this point from all the like moving. And so I I don't want to be too stressed with the driving. I don't like, I don't like it. I would like it if there were no cars on the road (laughs) and definitely no trucks, then I'd love it. I mean, just like driving in the Hudson Valley was so, so easy. I mean, especially where I was, I I didn't know what traffic was. Right. Um, It's going to be a whole new thing. Right. Right. All right. So the accomplice. Oh yeah. I have a book out. Remember this? Oh my God. (laughs) Awesome. Also looks awesome. Like the colors are very cool. I very like the, the red and then the purple. I mean, I, I like the cover too. I think it is actually, I don't want to give anything away exactly, but I think it's something from the book that I think a lot of people didn't like, they showed me the cover, but I don't think people realized that it was actually like what a character would be seeing. In a, in yes, exactly. Exactly. That's exa- yeah. I mean, like, that's exactly what I got. I was like, oh, oh good. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, totally, totally, totally. So, okay. So let's talk about the book. I have many questions. Um, the first is something that I've, uh, so you, the book is the story of, of I, I was thinking about this when I, when I was reading the book, it, obviously it's, it's um, the story of multiple people, but there's sort of one primary relationship. And it occurred to me, I was thinking about how a, a couple months ago, I listened to one of the New York Times book review podcasts. And it was, I think Brandon Taylor was reviewing Sarah, Sally Rooney's most recent novel and he mentioned something that like she had written or said that she often starts her books not with like a place or even necessarily a plot but with a relationship and I thought a lot about that when I was reading your book because obviously Luna and Owen is like the primary relationship in the book but in a way the book is a lot about relationships you know it's siblings it's parent child it's lovers it's it's marriage and everybody's is is very different so I kind of wanted to talk about like how you thought about relationships in this book I mean so it's not something that I think about too hard other than it's I mean it's the whole book ultimately I mean you have the structure that is the crime novel that sort of fits certain rules and you hope will make people keep reading and those feel like two sort of separate things and then there's sort of like everything in the book in that structure that it's the the design, whatever, it's, it's what, what you're filling into this other thing. And I'm not saying that, like, I love structure, and I love story, and I like surprises, but they, I feel like they're two separate parts of my creative process. So, I, I mean, you know, all of the Spellman books were about relationships. So that always felt no, I'm not going to say easy, but it always felt fun. Like, okay, there's this kind of relationship and this is what happens. I mean, I'm always trying to figure out in life and in writing, like sort of what, what makes someone do what they do. Like, and when I see behavior that doesn't fully make sense to me, I always want to make sense of it. Mm. So it's I, everything I think about and obsess about in life is sort of like, that's what I do in the book. Um, but I did primarily when I thought of the idea of, you know, having, I mean, it wasn't so much about the platonic male feel, female friendship, because in my life, those, that's fairly ordinary. Um, but it's more about like friendship in the sense of the family you choose and how those friendships can become very deep, even when you don't necessarily have that much in common. Mm. Um, I find that sort of thing interesting. And I, I've experienced that a lot myself, but the the big sort of crimey relationship type thing is just the sense of what is the point when you stop trusting a person that you trusted forever? Like, right. what would it take? And 
I like that idea of like, you're so sure of something and then something small or something big can completely shift it. Right, right. It's funny you were talking about how like one of the things you obsess over is like relationships and why people do what you do. And then I'm thinking about you talking about how in your home in the Hudson Valley, you are in many ways very isolated, right? Like, yeah. is there, what do you, what do you pull from when you're writing this stuff? Are there bits and pieces of other, of people, you know, of experiences you've had? There's, there's a mix of like, I mean, there are definitely like little things in the book. Um, so there's a scene in the book, this isn't, I don't, this isn't giving away any of the story where Owen and Luna are standing in line and Owen is standing really close to Luna and it's driving her crazy. And she's like, what are you doing? Why are you standing right behind me? And he's like, I'm just standing here so that no stranger stands behind you. And I realized uh, at some point, I didn't even know that this was a thing, but when Dave and I were on tour for Heads You Lose, and we were in airports, he kept doing that to me. He kept standing right behind me in line. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm just blocking other people from your wrath. And <laughs> I, I didn't even know that I seemed that crazy <laughs> when, I, I mean, I know I don't like strangers coming and I'm, I, if someone stands behind me, I will lose my mind. If someone's walking behind me, I just have to step aside and let them pass because it makes me crazy. But it's one of those things I thought only I see, other people don't see it. And then, then it became clear that that was a thing. So I definitely like things like that I use. Yes. I but, love to, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. But I also like, there are just as many weird things like that where it's also like, like, I don't know if you feel this way when you're writing, but there's a certain freedom of chaos and finding and using anything you can that, that works and feels true. So I love that too, like just out of nowhere. I love it when something's just totally out of nowhere. I don't like to use my own life, but that was a good thing and really amused me. So, yeah. You, I like, I love that too, the, the sense of like somebody knowing you so well that they and are anticipating something that like you didn't even really know about yourself and that that can be, you know, in a way like really comforting and wonderful, but also probably like very unnerving and maybe stressful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always find it nice when people, like I think I have a lot more things than I used, I don't know. I think I might be a little weirder about stuff and it might, the, the problem I think I fear is that my issues are making life difficult for someone else so much so that they feel like they have to intervene. So I hope I'm not that person, but I do <laughs> feel like people often intervene with me, like in a, especially in a public setting. You know, I, I have a, fr a very close friend and whenever we were in a restaurant together, it would, she would be the one who would always make sure there was no mayo. <laughs> my, my food. He's going to freak out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I would never throw a fit. I think the thing is, I would never say anything. And then I'd just be like, oh, there's mayo. Right, right, yeah. right. So so one of the things, like, obviously that this story has a lot of is is secrets, right? And right. and things that, you know, how having your own secret affects your life and life surround you, but then also like the, you know, and this, this was a thing in The Swallows too, like the outing of this secret spurs, you know, sort of the action of the book. What... You know, and I thought a lot about, you know, as I was reading this book, and again, I don't want to give anything away, but, you know, sort of some of the secrets, it's almost like they become bigger when they're not revealed, right? And then they sort of, like, I, and I, I sometimes think this about ourselves, like, we have these these secrets that feel like, oh, my God, if I reveal this, everyone will, everyone will reject me. But then once it's revealed, the, our people's reactions sometimes are different than than we might think they are. So I don't know, talk a little bit about like this book because a, a lot of people in this book have secrets, right? Well, it was important that Luna's secret was a secret that justified her hiding it. And ultimately it never truly came out. I mean, I don't want to give away too much, but that like, I didn't know when I started writing the book, I knew she had a secret, but I didn't know what it was going to be. Oh, that's and, interesting. And it took, the whole writing time till I got to it, till I really had worked it out. Like I thought about it a lot 
And this is the same sort of problem, not a problem, but it's something that I had to work on with the passenger, the, you know, the, the thing at the very end where you, you really have to like, because things like that, if they, if they fail to feel a plausible, for me, the test is, is it plausible? And is it a big enough deal to justify all the other behavior? And so often I read books and I'm like, oh, they, one or both of those things doesn't work. And for me, you know, my logic said the, this worked, but it took forever to get there. That's so interesting. I'm, I'm surprised, I guess. And, and also a little relieved because I feel like a lot of times when I'm writing, you know, there's like some big hole and I'm like, the, the motivation here is important, but I don't know what it is yet. So you were able, so, so let's talk, let's, let's go to like writing stuff, right? So when you're, yeah. how many drafts did like, do you bang through kind of a, do you outline, do you bang through stuff and kind of skip obviously kind of big stuff and just keep going and fill it in in a second draft? How does that work? I think, I don't think I'm skipping big stuff, but I think that with so many of my books, fairly big things have been added later. Mm. Um, I, I mean, as I don't know how often other other writers let you read first drafts. Like for me, we share an agent. So like my agent is basically one of the first people to see a very rough draft. And I I think I heard her, I saw an email or something where she she just said, oh, it's just the usual let's first draft. And she said it not with any, there was no, hey Steph, uh, there, I think she's watching. She mm -hmm. didn't say it with like, there was no judgment, but it suddenly became clear that other writers do a whole lot more polishing than mm -hmm. I do before they let people see drafts. So, I mean, everyone has their, I think I get just so like bananas by the time I finish a book, I just need someone to tell me if I've lost my mind, right. you know, is that answer? Right, right. Do <laughs> yeah. you do, I mean, like, do, do you know, what do you know about a book or, or does it differ for books? Like when you sort of started- Totally different, book, yeah. What, totally different for book, different books. Like what yeah. you know about the beginning, the end, the motivation, all that stuff yeah. is different for different books. Totally. I mean, with The Swallows, the, it was, I want to write about a gender war at a private school. It just started with that. Um, and then because it started with that, which is sort of a, sort of a bigger concept, then it became like this endless, endless uh, attempts at trying to figure out how to do it. Right. Like, you know, I tried so many different types of ways to tell a story, you know? So, and then, but a lot of times the, the goal is really like, I have this feeling. And so I want to sort of make sure that I convey this mm -hmm. feeling. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. And does it do like, now I'm just like asking you because I need advice. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, because I'm like, do, do you feel like, you know, how many drafts are you doing? Right. Like, I, are, I mean, not that each one is a whole different draft, but like, do you, you know, do you like really polish the first hundred pages and then oh. going or you're just like, do you feel like you have to have it like I've started to get where I feel like I, I want to just bang through and get a skeleton so yeah. that I have the plot mostly worked out and then the sort of more detailed deep like almost like almost sort of literary stuff kind of comes in later but the plot for me is the thing I have to hang on to I mean I think that that's probably the best way to do it I've, I've done different ways but I I think the important thing to to be clear on is my drafts are very rough. No matter how you slice it, no matter how I went about it, they are rough and they stay rough for, you know, I, there will always be like a couple drafts before like my editor sees it. And then my editor, it'll be like, I, I think around 2.5, but mm -hmm. then like, you know, copy editor to me, that's also like, they find things, they find mistakes that oh. are, require some some work so yeah it's it's a lot of drafts it's, it's a lot. so what so one <laughs> of the things that that impresses me the most about this book in your writing is you are able to this book especially was so seamless like most of the time when I read a book it's like one chapter is one person's point of view one chapter is another person's point of view and you are a, like 
we will be in the same chapter and you can jump from, you know, a cop, a moment in a cop's mind, a moment in Luna. So, and it's, I, my sense, it's unusual and you do it really seamlessly. Have, how do you do that? <laughs> like, and do you, do, is that something that you sort of are work, you work on a lot? Is that something that you, you consciously think all these people are in it together and I'm going back and forth through their minds? How does that work? So I know what you're thinking, because I think I've felt that way about that before, too. And I know that there are actually some readers who really hate it, but um, there's no reason why you can't do it. And I don't believe in, you know, but I do it for, for like my own kind of practical reasons. So I think I write better when I write in first person. However, a lot of stories that I want to tell really work better if it's third person. Yeah. But third person can be everything. Third person doesn't like sometimes I have to get out of my head thinking it's a distant narrator. And and so I think with this book I tried to loosen up my thought process on that. Totally. I mean, I'm, that's my whole like create creativity creativity. See, I can't even say it. I'm so tired. Um <laughs> it I, I'm really into all the things we can do to just free up our mind from all the rules we think we're supposed to be following. Right. I mean, I was reading this book and I was like, oh, I, I remember thinking like, you're allowed to do that? Like, and, <laughs> and, and it makes me think like, well, you can, you, any, you can do if it works, right? And, and yeah. if it feels seamless, right? Um, I didn't feel like I was being jolted around. And that was what sort of sparked my attention. At first, I was like, oh my God, I was just in three people's head heads but I felt like like it felt like a pan you know it felt like it was it was it wasn't stressful for me I'm glad I'm glad that it wasn't it probably was for me <laughs> well, <laughs> that's right so so <laughs> so that brings me to like a, a related question which is about timeline right so this book takes place right right <laughs> I know we sort of talked about this like you know at, in what is it 2000 and What's the first? Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna let you sit it's there. Twenty nineteen <laughs> is the present, and That's and two thousand and like three, three, right? So yeah. it's and and you do that is very, um, you know, signposted, right? Here we are, here we are, here we are. Yeah. Um, but and then you make it look easy, you know. But I know it's not easy. How did you always know it had to be that you were gonna spend time, you know, it's not just like flashbacks, but like we're spending time in the past and in the present. And then how was that writing? How did you manage that? I mean, I I keep a lot of notes, not like, not like an anal person's really good notes that like are actually helpful, but like just chaos notes. <laughs> like, honestly, like I just would keep notes in different places so they, it was stupid, but it was almost like the process of writing it down. I would think, oh, well, maybe I'll remember now. And then I wouldn't remember. I mean, it's just a headache. It, And I don't like, I know a lot of people say they don't have a good memory, but I, I legit, legit don't have a good memory. I actually had uh, some memory tests done and the shrink said my, my performance was abysmal. It's really bad, really bad. So yeah, everything has to be written down and then I have to kind of stay in the book constantly mm. so I don't lose it. Because if I step aside for a day, it's all gone. But that said, when I reread, everything's fresh. Right. Like, I'm like, oh, I wrote this. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Someone else wrote it. So what's your, do you have a writing, I don't know, schedule or like, what's your writing life like for, well, no for novels? Because you, you know, I mean, you have other things you're doing too. You have, a, you know, you have a life, right? Like, when you're writing a novel, what's, what's okay. what are the weeks and months like? So I haven't been working on anything for a while because I've been moving and that was my excuse that there was no way I could do both. <laughs> so I have not done anything. But when I, in the past, when I was a writer, <laughs> <laughs> not a mover, uh, I, I would always just start. I had to start first thing in the morning as I'm drinking coffee. Nothing else can get in because the lazy streak I have is epic. Mm -hmm. So if, if I start doing something else, it gets lost. And then I'm not someone who can write in the afternoon or the evening. I certainly can't start in, in the afternoon. Um, 
So I would basically write as long as I could stand it. Um, I will say that like there was a very nice routine with the Spellman book, books that felt very cush. It's just sort of like, you know, the a thousand words a day done in four months or whatever. Okay. And then, I mean, it was, that was okay. different. It, books take longer now and they're a bigger, like they're a bigger headache, but I do feel like the thousand words a day is, is good at keeping me on point. It's not as much as I'd like to do. When I hear stories about writers who like, like sit in a chair for eight hours or they write 3000 words a day or more. I, I mean, I just think they're, they have a really good Coke dealer. I don't know. I, I think they're lying. <laughs> I, don't know, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that, but to, honestly, to me, a thousand words a day, that's a, that's like a great, a great day an almost impossible day for me. I'm like, you know, 400. And if, but if I do that enough, then I could finish a book in a year or whatever. Like, yeah, but you have a child, a young child. I feel like that's a totally, like, I, I have nothing. <laughs> I have, I don't even have people I have to entertain because I <laughs> live so remotely. And yet I still had trouble like maintaining it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, but oh, so, wait, okay. All right, sorry. No, I was going to ask about the Spellman books because somebody in the chat asked, are you going to do another Spellman book? And I'm interested, you can answer that, but I'm also interested in like, what was different about the Spellman books in terms of writing? I mean, I, there was something really nice about like spending every day looking for it, the, something really funny. And yeah. so it it did sort of bleed into my life where I, like, I, I definitely remember being a little bit happier then. Also, it was during the Obama years as well, mm. which... We so were all happier. Yeah. yeah. Some of sometimes I associate my standalone life, or at least the well no. Right, because the kind of fires like more, many years, not many years. Yeah, that ago. was also during not Trump years. So right. that was a while ago. That one was harder though. It wasn't quite as fun. It was just, you know, if you're writing comedy, it's just a little bit more fun. Do you so then? I don't, I don't know why I'm asking this because I really love these standalones, but like, why did you switch if it's more fun to do the other? Well, A, I don't even know that I noticed it was more fun, but <laughs> I, you know, you always sort of, it takes you a while to realize things. It, I think it took me years after I was done with the Spellman books to realize how much, to, how much easier my life felt during those years. But, you know, you don't want to keep, I didn't want to keep writing the same book over and over again. And I did feel like I was like I could revisit it now but I'm really glad that I stepped aside and did other things yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I well I wrote you know it's a, a three book series and I, I I felt the same way I was just like there are other people I'm interested in spending time with really yeah you know another but yes people are saying well I have another Spellman book all right so you have <laughs> you, know you have fans right yeah all right so let's let's talk about I have a couple more questions. Oh, one while I'm drinking my beer is about alcohol because, and it's funny, I, I, as I was drink, as I'm reading the book, I, I, I'm just reading, reading. And then at some point I realized I was like, everybody's, they're always opening a bottle of wine. <laughs> there is always alcohol or weed or whatever, which, you know, it felt exactly, I mean, in college, certainly like the, the quest to just like get fucked up is constant. Right. But then yeah. even as adults, like, we drink a lot and a lot of people, you know, I mean, like um, Owen's parents were like, like the, 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 the are, you know, a, a, an ex I mean, I know parent, you know, older people like that, right. Who like every right. night they're going to pass out. Right. And <laughs> yeah. I, I actually found that that relationship, the Owen's parents, Owen and Griff's parents as, and their relationship in that home, one of the most interesting and chilling parts of the book, like that family dynamic for me, now that I'm thinking about it, was really unsettling and it it gave me a lot more obviously insight into Owen but also an empathy for for Owen and like how he dealt with that in Griff too so 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 I don't know if you want to talk about like the role of alcohol in, <laughs> in people's lives or in the books but but you could also maybe talk about about Owen's family because that feels like a place where that came out a lot yeah I mean to be honest I didn't notice I didn't really think about the, a lot of drinking in the book. I think my uncle, after he read it, was like, I like had a hangover. <laughs> and he was the first person to say that, mention all the drinking. And the thing is, 
there was a lot of drinking in the spelling books too, or at least Isabel was drinking a lot <laughs> around people drinking. But I think that A, you know, there's the whole college thing where it, at least in my experience, it was super boozy. And then if you're hanging out with people you knew in college, I think you do tend to drink a little bit more around them, at least also. Yeah, so yes, I do pull from personal experience, come to think of it. Um, <laughs> But with Owen's parents, so there's a scene, I won't get too into it, but where uh, Luna goes back to Owen's, uh, you know, their, their, ex, their vacation home. I couldn't come up with the word. And the, his family seems on the surface so like kind of fun and full of life and like the kind of family that he, everyone sort of envies and then Luna gets a glimpse of that sort of flip side and what's really going on. And um, I always like things like that because I think so often we we get people wrong. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I distinctly remember like, it, this is a, a, almost an opposite. It's not even an opposite. It's a totally different thing, but it's also similar. I have a, a friend and I I always thought his family was so, so like weirdly normal. And then he told them I said that and then they well I can't say what it is but they showed me something so weird <laughs> that I realized oh I I I am so wrong and it was good to be reminded how wrong it can be right right so and and that like kind of you know you don't really ever know anybody thing is something that also is a lot a part of the book like that 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 throughout the whole time we're finding out about people but also there even though they've had these long relationships finding out things about each other that I don't I, you know I that that feels it, it makes the whole thing feel very kind of like tenuous and unmoored right like all these relationships are a little like like teetering they thought they were secure but they're teetering yeah I mean there you know secrets can be kept for a number of reasons and some secrets people keep uh, actually reveal a lot about them and not necessarily like bad things. Like, like there's something like if this were a book club, I would want to talk about, but I don't want to give anything away. But yeah, I was always interested. Like, I think when people do good things, they, they like to make sure people know about it. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's fascinating when someone will keep that to themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So so one of the things also that I wanted to ask about was like, when I think about all the women in the book, right? So the main, you know, Scarlett, Luna, Irene, they're each of them, like, like I, I said this to you, like have this kind of idea of like, they're a different kind of woman. They're all like, you know, I mean, Scarlett's kind of this like beautiful, but kind of self-conscious woman, girl, you know, woman, Luna is like, like she's this like almost like a put on of like I'm complicated I'm I'm bristly I'm you know but 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 then and then Irene is like super independent and but she's also burdened and I love that you had all these different women in this one story and and also they're all connected you know they're all connected to Owen right and like he I, has love like it's almost like they're each a different personality trait or something so I like I don't know what we like you know, uh, your books often are, you know, are very much about women and a lot of your work is about, you know, women and feminism and, you know, what, what, so what, like, what made you sort of want to write about such different women? I mean, Luna, I felt like I just was sort of working out what would a person end up like if she had all these things going on. And, and then also, I think it's important, like, when, like, when you're writing, like Luna might have been a little bit different when I first started the book mm. than after I sort of figured a lot of things out. And then once I figured some things out, I would have likely have gone back through that character and changed stuff. Because mm. it's like the, the, the way it progresses is just sort of as a person changes, but with time travel. So like, mm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you realize she's different and then you kind of, you just, you shave away an edge here or you add something there. Right. Um, and then uh, Irene came last. So uh, Owens, I think it's okay to say that she, yeah. So I, Irene Owens 
wife in the more present time is murdered. And that's sort of really the, the, the catalyst that hits everything off. But I only had her, I didn't have her seen that much at the very, in the very early drafts. And then I went back over and sort of fleshed her out and we got to see her. So all of the stuff that shows her life and fleshes her out in the middle of the book was never there. Hmm. Um, but it felt important, like when you have a female murder victim, there's just so often in so many crime stories, it's just a victim that isn't anything other than who she is in a man's eyes. Oh my uh, God. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you do a great, like, yes. I mean, I exactly like, or, or that, or that the book is then about like the journey of the man who loved her after she is murdered. Right. Like his redemption. Right. Exactly. Like yeah. Exactly. So right. it felt important to, to have her be something, but I needed to first create a woman that Owen would fall in love with. But I also, it felt more interesting if Luna and Irene were, were close. And so then I had to figure out like, what, so what's Irene like? And that was actually, working out Irene was actually really fun. I, I ended up really loving her as a I character. really liked Irene. Like, like there were, I had a lot of, I felt a lot of pleasure in those Irene chapters. Like she felt, oh she felt very different from the other women in a way that made me just really like her. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. And all her back, well, I, yeah, I don't want to get too much into it, but, but, but her connections to all the people involved were, it's super interesting. So, and then, you know, then, then the men in the book, right? Griff, Griff and Owen are, you know, brothers, but, but very different. And then like, you know, Luna's at one husband and then there's a best friend. Again, like very different kinds of people. It like, do you, when you're building characters, is it kind of just like, you know, you're kind of just writing and writing and like, as you go through drafts, you're honing in on things or do you have like, I mean, people do like character cards and like, you know, Sam is this, Owen is this. How do you... Because they're yeah. very different. Like, I mean, they come on the page and they're very specific, different whole humans. How it takes a while. Because you, so you start with a general-ish, like it's kind of like this, but then you, you want to make sure you're not, you know, just sort of reinforcing a cliche to archetype of a person. Right. So you, but then as, you know, if there one thing, as I was just saying, if one thing changes later on or you, you realize something, you start to, shift your opinion of how you've done everything up till then. But um, I, I mean, it feels important, but I, I, I think I focus on it in part because I know that people lose track hmm. when they're reading. Um, and I just don't like, I don't want people to be like, wait, who's that again? So right. Right. that's, that's it, part of it. Right, it's, you know, now that I think about it, it's true. Like there were a lot of characters in this book. They're all, but they're all like, the, you couldn't mistake one for the other. You know what I mean? I like they play very specific roles and have very specific lives. I mean, bravo, well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me then too. Like, do you have any? One thing I'm always interested in with crime writers, right? Like, pretty much everything you write. You know, as you said, like there's the skeleton of the like this is a crime novel, but really like a lot of what you're working out is relationships and humans and all this stuff. Right. Um, why do you? I've had people ask me like I've I've talked to a friend recently about like okay, well this is the book blah blah blah, and I said something, but yeah, who gets killed? And she was like, you know, that nobody has has to get killed in the book, right? And I was like, oh no, no no, I think they do, um, or some crime has to be committed. Yeah. yeah. What do you like about? Like, cause not, not every book of crime is committed, right? Like, what do you, what draws you to that? What keeps you there? Do you think you'll stay in that? Well, I, I mean, even books of mine that aren't traditional crime books right. are structured like a crime book. So for me, like, I mean, I've gotten really bad about like, I don't want to read anything or watch anything unless something really bad happens. To totally. Something. Yeah. And this, there, it's not, it has nothing to do with like being that into crime, although it's fascinating. It's more about, I know if someone's writing a crime novel, I'm promised a plot. Yes. And honestly, there are times I'm reading a book that is really well written, but at some point I just stop caring. Yeah. And I don't know if it's my fault or their fault. 
Mm. I'm fine taking the blame. It's my fault. But Mm -hmm. if I know that about myself, then why would I, why would I do that to anyone else? If I know to yourself, right? Like if you're going to be the one spending X number of years inside a book. Yeah. It's fun to work with that structure. Um, I just, you know, I do personally, I think I'd have a hard time writing something with a totally like totally crazy plot, which is sometimes a little bit tricky in that, like, I don't know, you know, every time you think of rethink a crime and stuff like that, it always feels like you're getting to a point where like, you're, I don't know. I always worry. I'm going to just jump the shark. At some point. <laughs> right. 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 I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I guess that's, that's, po- I don't know. I also feel like at some level, every book that is successful is a mystery uh, to some extent, right? Maybe it's not a crime mystery. Right? I agree. But, like, the mystery of how this relationship will end up, yes. how these people will deal with whatever is set in front of them. And once I figured that, cause I wrote, I don't know if you, did you do this? Like when, when I was younger, I wrote almost two, no- one novel and like another half of a novel that are just sitting there and they had no real structure and and it wasn't until I sort of came up realized oh all the books I read have like a a murder to them or you know something like that that I realized oh like like that's going to help me finish the book is that if I have that you know somebody dies we figure out how somebody did it and that helped me as an author just figure out like how am I going to finish a book but then when I started do reading other books I realized like this is you know this like you know sort of what do they call them like I don't know, woman, women's fiction about friendship is a mystery about like, how is this friendship going to end up given the situation or whatever? Right. No, I've, I've always felt like a, that was what I was doing, but I've always felt like any story can be a mystery. And I do think I, every time I read something that I really want to keep reading, it feels like that. Right. Um, and so to me, that's why there's no excuse for me to be reading something and, and to be bored because right. Uncovering layers of a person can be fascinating if you do it right. And you don't need that much, like, sort of big stuff to happen. Um, right. right. Yeah. Right. Okay. One more question, and then we'll open it up. And that was just sort of like my, you know, I'm always like, what do you see as your, do you have like a kind of mission or overarching kind of? theme of, of, of your work as a novelist, right? Like this is, you are a writer, right? Like you, you know, is it about, Am I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are, yeah. you know, like, like that is what you do. You create stories and mind people. And, and so do you have like a, like a theory of your work or, uh, or something you're trying to do? Yeah. In, yeah. I mean, I've always just, my thing is like, I really just want to keep showing mostly it's women, but, uh, you know, just characters that are just not what we keep seeing, but women is the big thing for me. Like, I'm so tired of seeing boring women. I, so it's always my goal that the women have to be more interesting than the men in the books, but that doesn't mean the men can't be interesting. It just, I'm so tired of that sort of the flip of like maybe one sort of interesting, weird female character and five totally out there fun whatever. Like I can't stand it. It makes me psychotic when I see it or read it. Like all the women I know are bananas. So (laughs) I, I, this just, art doesn't reflect life in in so many things. So that's like the big thing um, I'm interested in. That sounds a little like, I I remember hearing Laura Lippman talk once about, somebody said something about like, well, why do you why is the, the victim or so, all the women I know are bananas, right? Um, uh, uh, it wanted like said something about like somebody criticized her and said, well, why are the women, you know, why is the woman a victim or why is the woman the killer? And she was like, well, in my books, the women get the best roles, you know? And, and I was like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you write, can we just talk about you for a second? Cause I, uh, the missing hours is so, so great. Um, but all of, if you see a Julia doll book in a bookstore, anyone will do, they're all, mm-hmm. right. but the missing hours is the most recent one I read and it's, it's really awesome. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Yes. I you. was having a lot of time, trouble reading things. And mm-hmm. then I picked that up and it was like, oh, I am here. Thank you. Oh. Very nice. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So, so I, I'm, I haven't been very good about monitoring the chat. I don't know, Susanna, have you seen any questions that 
that we should or, or in others questions for Lisa yes. in Ohio. If anyone wants to drop a question into the Q&A, please do. We had one in there that you sort of answered, but just in case there's anything else you wanted to cover, which was what was your favorite part about writing Luna and Owen's relationship? Mm. Um, I, I don't know. Oh, I liked, I mean, the thing is I can't, I want to be specific about scenes that I, I think would ruin, would be spoilers or wouldn't make sense. So there were specific scenes that I just really was found very exciting. Um, yeah. I really loved that really. I, my closest, one of my closest friends from college is a man and we've been close, close friends for you know, we're, it's almost 25 years now. And, and I felt like you can, and, and there's a, you know, the way our friendship is, is different than my friendship with, with my close female friends, but it's very deep and important to me. And I get stuff out of it. And I think he does too, probably that I don't get from my friendship with, with women. And I feel like he's helped me you know, I now, you know, I live with a man, I'm married to a man and I have, I'm raising a small man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think a lot about what is it to be a man and what is, you know, what are the challenges? Cause I, cause I like you, I mean, like most of my characters are women, like that's who I'm mostly interested in. Right. Um, but now that I have to like create a decent man, I am started to think more and more about how men view things. And I thought like, I thought you did a really good job just of, of just spending time with these, with men and you're not a man I mean you know it's like this is your this is your role as the author is to be an empathic and to you know yeah be, yeah no I I like men and I feel like I <laughs> I understand a lot of them <laughs> not but but then again I can also say that there are a lot of women I don't understand and uh, people I really really don't understand I'm probably not going to write about because right. it's too exhausting to have to live with that I think too one of the things that you do well in this book is sort of the way that men and women are different because of the way that they're expected to be different, right? The way that they're treated by other people, by their parents, by the expectations of like what they're supposed to be, you know? And that really matters, I think. And I think you do a pretty a good job of like articulating that without articulating it sort of. Yeah, I think it was one of the first sort of like huge insights I had when I was a little kid. And I was like, this is messed up. I, mean, I was so young and I was like, uh-uh. This, I, I mean, someone tried to put a dress on me and I was not having it. There were some fights you wouldn't believe. That's interesting. Are we like, should we, I mean, I don't know what you. I have a couple of questions. If, okay. Oh, okay. If anyone watching, please drop silly questions <laughs> in the chat too, we're fine. Um, so you guys have both been doing this for a minute. So you've seen the um, sort of change in the mystery thriller genre over these last few years of this sort of shift towards the centering of women's stories mm -hmm. and domestic suspense, um, with, which have led to like really massive sales and a lot of new readership. I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about, about that trajectory. And, and from, from a bookstore perspective, it hasn't slowed down, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty amazing. You know, I mean, we might not have like another gone girl on our hands, but, but it's, everything is kind of selling, hmm. um, which is really beautiful. So thoughts, yeah. feelings. I mean, I don't know that I was really aware of that. I just knew that like, I like reading domestic suspense probably more than anything else. So when I'm in a bookstore, sometimes I, I, I actually go out of my way to find a book by a man because hmm. So often I'm like, oh, that looks, I mean, I'm much more interested in things women are, are writing and definitely domestic suspense of some kind is the thing that usually gets me. Yeah, I feel the same way. And I think the domestic, like the, the thing I think about it is, is just that crime stories, you know, for so long, what felt like it was supposed to be a crime story was like a cop story, a story told by, yeah. by the people who are like solving the crime. But like the innovate, I mean, obviously, people have been writing this stuff forever. But but as a reader, I, I discovering like, oh, I can read about and then write about the people who the crime affects, right? And 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 that the the sort of more the, the more it, emotional and psychological effects are just as exciting as the like who done it yeah oh I love that I never 
broken down why I like these books so much, but I think that might be <laughs> <the plan laughs> nailed it for me. Thank you. <laughs> we have another question from the audience. Where do your characters' names come from? Yeah, Luna's That's a great. great question. Luna is perfect for, and, and her name is at, like kind of a thing in this. Yeah, no, it is. And, but I, I honestly, I couldn't tell you where the name came from. I will say that I used to have this app, but then I had to pay for it, like called Characterize or something. Wow. I'm so bad at names. So, so sometimes my friend Dave, like I would email him and I would describe the character and then he'd come back with uh, a name. He would, and he was really good at it. He could do it with street names too, town names. Or, mm. And uh, these are things I really struggle with, but sometimes it's an app. Sometimes I just keep looking at names until I, you know, I, it feels right. Right. <laughs> just, it's very annoying but it never it takes it slows down the writing process yes. trying to find a name and I find it super exhausting yes yes and often if you look in a phone book you're like that's not real <laughs> right right yeah no I'm I mine just sort of yeah they pop up you know, it, it sounds good. Right. Yeah. And then sometimes I, and then I end up switching them eventually, but it's true. It's very hard. And this is the same about titles. I would love to know about your titles. I feel very unmoored in a book. If I don't have a title that I feel confident with, even though often they change, but like, was this always the accomplice? No, I didn't have a title. Um, and once again, it was Dave who, I, mean, I don't even know, I might've asked for it, but he just sort of offhandedly said, oh, the accomplice could work. And then when I shared it with um, the editors and everyone at, at Ballantyne, uh, they loved it right away. I thought we were gonna have more of a discussion about it. I don't even know that I, I was that into it, but it like, it worked. Like if I have a title, I'll fight for it. But if it's like, if I don't know, if I really don't know, I'm open to whatever that I can live with. Yeah. Sometimes I've heard, you know, I've heard stories of whatever. I've there are some titles people have tried to make me use that have like I, I will fight to the death to not have totally, it. totally. Like I do not like titles without like real nouns in them, you know, that are just like, well, I, actually I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like shit on any titles, but <laughs> no, now I wanna know. <laughs> I'm never gonna do that. But but um yeah, yeah, yeah. I my last the missing hours was like five different titles before we came at that, and it became where I was just like, just somebody come up with a title that people like that I can live with. I can't handle this anymore. Like I just yeah, wanna, it yeah. can be very stressful. Yeah, because it feels like to me it it feels like it's like it's not a book if it doesn't have a title. Like it's just a thing. I don't know. I'm okay writing without a title because I'm getting some work done, which is a, as I've explained a problem for me. So. <laughs> Um, but it, everything, it, every book is different. Like some it's been super obvious and then others. Yeah. Am I allowed to ask if you're, you said you're not really working on something now, but are you I'm working like, on an idea in my head? Okay. That's, that's enough, dude. That's where it starts. Yeah. You gotta start somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so right, we good. have, we have time for one more question and Lori has actually posed a perfect final question. Oh. Thank you, Lori. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Lori. I'm going to reverse it to end on a positive image. So for each of you, what do you hate about writing and what do you love? That's a good question. Oh man. Hmm. Oh, okay. So what I hate hmm. is uh, how often I've, I've realized my limitations when I'm writing and how I am not as able to to accomplish the things I, I have in my head. And what I love is that it's mine completely and I can do whatever I want. I think I might hate the same thing. And like the, the feeling of like, everybody, people do this better than I do. Why, why, why is this so hard to, you know, I have this idea in my head, this relationship emotion, why can't I make it work on the page? Um, but what I, love is that I feel like I live, you know, I live with the, I live in the physical world with the people I love and care about. And then I live in my head with all different other people that fascinate me. Like, I feel like I have a whole other set of characters in my life that I get to hang out with. And 
nobody can take them away from me. I love that. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much. What thank you so much. This was. Oh, thank you to everyone who I read this book tonight. really fast. I was up way too late and then had to get up early with, with small child. And I was <laughs> kind of hating you a little bit sometimes, but this is a really great book. This I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yay. Thank you so much. Bye for your friends. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Good Take night. copies of their books at Oblong or at your local indie. Thank you all so much. Good night, everybody. Good night.